This is the GPL Podcast, part of the Pull Tab Sports family. You know, I, I think there is some shenanigans happening in the goalie community. Are you, are you going to speak on that? In as, the goalie as a, community. Oh, you, gotta oh, goalie. you know I got to ride with goalie nation, but... Um, <laughs> Okay, we got to complete the same question. Duck, duck. <laughs> goose. Oh! <laughs> it ain't gray duck, it's goose. <laughs> but the Big Ten's a bad conference. That's a joke. If, if this gets clipped, that's a joke. Oh, no, oh, no, no. <laughs> We're definitely cooking that one now. Now, here's Jupiter and Vigo. Let me actually unmute the mic because I had us muted. Live stuff. <laughs> I laugh. It's not exhibition season. Uh, it's not exhibition. real. Live from the Ralph. Here we are, folks. Episode 245. I'm already getting text messages. People already bugging me. So here we are, guys. You know, we have been talking about this for years, coming up mm-hmm. here and doing a show. Um, it's finally happened. Um for me, it's just it was it was a fun drive up. It was exciting. I'm thinking about the weekend, not just the hockey, but the people. Hmm. You know, we just met, met some of the Inglestead family that yeah. was just here, and uh, it's just it's not about just the hockey beast. It's it, kind of the whole thing. Well, that's what makes college hockey great, yeah. especially this series so awesome. Is the fans and the history yeah, and so- how much everyone puts into it. And you can just feel as you talk to the players on North Dakota week, how excited everyone mm-hmm. is, all the great memories they have of the series and how players are trying to make their own mark on this series. Yeah. And for, you know, for the fans, see if, if you watch some of the highlights of last year's series, uh, you just see uh, Minnesota and North Dakota fans sitting by each other all throughout the arena. And uh, I think they went back and forth all, all uh, weekend and uh, Minnesota wins one in overtime, North Dakota wins one in overtime and, um, that's probably uh, epitomizes the series, you know, just uh, two fantastic games. Both of yes. them were just great games. Um, and, you know, when you think of over the years, there just are so few times you leave the rink uh, saying, you know, that, that wasn't very good. You know, well, there was a couple of Mariucci. There, were, there were a couple. Oh, there were, they, what one? The second game was a, a good game. Yeah, it that was came better. down to yep. the very end. Yep. Yeah, it was. Uh, North Dakota had the block shot uh, six on five at the end of that game. So uh, the, the, there have been, but the the number of times they've played, the percentage of times that they've come through with thrilling games is quite high. It was pretty funny. I was asking Jimmy Snuggerud this week, you know, what's his favorite memory of this rivalry? And he's like, well, you know, I had a front seat to watch mm-hmm. Matthew Nyes drive for the mm-hmm. overtime winner. I was like, that's got to be right up there for me. It's the loudest I've ever heard a hockey rink. Mm-hmm. And that just shows you what it means to these players today. Yeah. And the atmosphere, as he talked about how loud it was uh, last year. And even though they're in different leagues and, it, <laughs> you know, the rivalry probably isn't quite the same because of that. But I mean, man, it, it's, I find it hard to believe there's something better in college hockey. Well, let's recap kind of last weekend, Vigs, uh, kind of a home and home with St. Thomas, um, home game. Mariucci was eh, not too bad, but it kind of started off at the X Friday night, and uh, the whole student section for St. Thomas was there. Yeah, I think that just shows the potential that St. Thomas has as a school, as a program. Mm -hmm. They are going to be a real player in college hockey sooner rather than later. And I think that just added to that atmosphere. You know, no rivalry between St. Thomas and Minnesota, but it certainly felt like one. And I think the way that Minnesota played and allowed St. Thomas to really get into it on Friday night yeah. added to kind of that emotion for the St. Thomas student section. You know, the, I think the first period Minnesota played okay, and they got two nice goals, you know, one from um, Jackson Nelson, one from Aaron Hughlin. And maybe they're thinking, okay, let's get some points. Let's feel good about our game. 
And then that second period, they kind of forgot about how hard you have to play in college hockey, especially defensively with positioning and battling. And they let the Tommies right into it. And all of a sudden, we had a hockey game. I do really Bob's where it's like, I don't know who that team was or something to that effect when you talked about the second period. Yes. The second period, you know, the transition from summer hockey to actual hockey season <laughs> is very, very different. Yeah. All of a sudden, you get next to someone and you're like, oh, I got them covered. You don't have their stick. You're not feeling where they are, and all of a sudden that puck comes in, and you're, you're not ready. behind the defense, wide open. <laughs> yep. Or you know you're a defenseman on the rush, and you follow the rush all the way below the dots behind the net. Yeah. And then you're not ready to get back and back check and play defense because in summer hockey you maybe you'll go for a line check or something, <laughs> but in real hockey no one's coming on for you, and you got to get back. Yeah. You, know, you you think the the, the league that a lot of those guys play in they're playing four and four, and it's just it's race horse hockey. It's no defense. Maybe Dinah. What's that? Uh, Beauty League. Beauty League. Yes. Yeah. Because quite a few of them play in there. And it's just, that's just all star type of game hockey. There. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a real wake up call. I think the film session Saturday morning was yes. intense, according to some of the players. Uh, Jimmy Sugnerud actually called it the coach's day Saturday. He did. When they go through the clips. And I think it was a learning lesson for them because it, it showed up on Saturday. They, they played a much tighter game. I still saw some defensemen going for walks in the offensive zone and getting deep, but they were getting back. Yeah. They were getting back to their positioning. It was a much cleaner game for them. A much better defensive game, obviously. I mean, there's the shutout, but they played. It wasn't just it wasn't the goalie's fault. It wasn't close fault anyway on Friday night. They just played better defensively, kept into the outsides of yeah. a now smaller rank. <laughs> yeah. Bob <laughs> calls it, uh, don't go looking for trouble, because when you go and look for offense, Sometimes you're going to get yourself in trouble. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if you just let the game come to you, you know, you're going to be a better hockey player and you're going to put yourself in better positions. I, I go back and look at someone like Jackson Lacombe. He was looking for trouble a lot as a young <laughs> hockey player. He was. But as he matured, he let the situations come to him up much better. And then he was able to be more productive, get just as many points, and not give away as many. On the other side, you guys had the icebreaker. You hosted it here, didn't you? Yeah. Um, speaking with some people coming in tonight, they said uh, the Wisconsin game was rather rowdy. Yeah. Because a lot of the students and fans had been partying all day after a big win by the <laughs> football team, yeah. drinking since early in the morning. And then they're yeah. like, let's finish the night here. Yeah. I hear it was just a, a wild atmosphere. It was. Um, it started in, in the, the parking lot of the Alaris Center at <laughs> bright and early in the morning. And uh, yeah, uh, the football team uh, beat their uh, rival North Dakota State. It was the first time in 20 years they had oh. beaten them. They 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 had they'd only played five times in that span, so it's not like they had mm -hmm. lost 19 year old. But still, they hadn't experienced that in a long time, and obviously they've had a lot of success. So that and the fans uh, come on over here afterwards. It's another long time traditional rival, Wisconsin. I've uh, played with a little bit more of an edge than. I recall seeing in the last couple of years, um, you can there. see that you can see it already. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, North Dakota won at two zero. I, I felt the score was a little misleading. It felt like more of a four to three game than two zero. Um, Wisconsin hit the post five times. Uh, so, um, you know, Ludwig person played very well in that, uh, got a little help from, from the posts, North Dakota probably generated more than, you know, two goals usually. So I, that's misleading, but great game. Um, and I think Wisconsin's going to be uh, a really good team this year. They got some great pieces. Just makes the Big Ten stronger, Biggs. Yeah. It's really hard to pick the Big Ten one to seven right now. I think all seven of them have the potential to be in the tournament discussion based on how they do in their non-conference. It's going to be a battle to the end of the year. Well, I just think of both teams this weekend have a gauntlet now for the next two weeks. <laughs> Who, yeah. North Dakota is not Minnesota coming in this week. That mm -hmm. was Wisconsin last week, one game. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got uh, Duluth and Mankato or well, something they, like They've that. got Minnesota State yeah. first. Then they go to BU after BU, that. BU, that's right. So they, you know, and I, obviously I've saw Minnesota stretch too. So these, we're going to find out a lot about both teams early yeah. on. Because, you know, next week, Wisconsin comes to town. Then it's a home and home with Duluth. And then we're going to Michigan. Uh, you're right. I think a lot's going to be learned in the next school, but will a lot be learned? It's still early in the season, B. It's definitely early, and Minnesota has got so many young defensemen that they have to play right now. 
Yeah. And it, we'll get, probably get to this later, but Ryan Chesley picked yeah. up an injury late in the game against St. Thomas on Saturday. He's questionable for this weekend. Mike Kester picked up a lower body injury in preseason skates and still isn't back. He was on the ice this week, but he's still a ways away from playing. So Minnesota is having to get these young defensemen in the game right now, and it's a lot of ice time for them, especially when last year they were used to throwing out Faber and Lacombe and Johnson for all these key situations. Now they're having to go to middle set, Chesley and, and Cal Thomas, and they're trying to get Renzel up to speed. And, and he's a talented player, but it's a big leap from juniors to college hockey, especially the schedule Minnesota plays. I think I saw Saturday night that Chesley played 28 minutes for Minnesota, and that was more minutes than any of their D played almost at, at any time last year. Like that, yeah. I, I definitely, that was eye opening seeing that. Well, number it was there. a big seven man rotation last year, Geeks. And you got a guy out, all of a sudden it's not anymore. Yeah. I mean, they're trying to get all seven defensemen right now in the lineup. Yep. But it's tough because. St. Thomas is playing hard, and it's challenging to get these young players out there. And Chesley adds something to the lineup that not all the other defensemen do. He can skate. He can be physical. He can join the rush. I think one thing for his development, he's going to have to learn how to play those minutes and be effective because I think his game kind of went up and down where he checked in and checked out, You know, maybe trying to catch a breath on the ice. Mm -hmm. He's got to learn. You can't really do that. You got to be in the game all the time. And that – Ice time is probably without him playing any power play time either. Mm -hmm. I didn't look at which that is part, amazing because it's been middle yeah. set Renzel mostly in the power play. Field, we've got so. we've got Corey V. Public should have access to time on ice. Day. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I agree. Uh, Vegas, Before we get too much further here, I know we need to. We've got a couple of uh, spots we want to talk about. Duke Cannon. I noticed you were just fixing up your hair a little while ago, just to look good, weren't you? Yeah, I had to freshen up. I was wearing the pull tab hat earlier, but then I wanted to show off my hair, which is <laughs> I sometimes think is a weapon. And uh, <laughs> Gopher Puck Live, part of Pulse Sports uh, family this year, and that means we need to make sure our hockey hair is elite. One weapon in your hair care arsenal should be Duke Cannon's men's grooming products. They're a Minnesota company that makes hardworking products for hardworking men. Whether it's serious flow, styling putty, adding some structure to your game, or news anchor thick hair to increase some volume. Visit DukeCannon.com, Target, or even your local hardware store for products to make your hair a weapon. Let me tell you, Viggs, I'm uh, using a little bit of the, the news anchor myself. Getting some volume? <laughs> Doing what you got. Well, it's, it's, well, one thing with my hair, though, Viggs, is that sometimes, you know, if it gets too big, I look more like one of the, the, the Cotter kids from Welcome Back, Cotter. For all you young kids out there. Old 70s TV show, Big Hair. So. I don't even know that one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I am so old. We'll just say that now. <laughs> but also, we, we need to talk about Fertiviegs. Um, The fundraising stuff they've been doing is right up a lot of our audience's alley. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have to fundraise for all your youth sports that you have going on. And Ferta Fundraisers is here to put the fun back in fundraising with staff to plan around your needs. Support from start to finish and plans to maximize your return while staying close to retail prices. Berta prides themselves on showcasing local premium products like Joe Mama Salsa. We love that mm. stuff. Uh, Von Hansen's Pretzel Snacks and Croy Valley Barbecue Rugs and Sauces. Visit FertaFundraisers.com to ignite your fundraising. Ferta Boys, Ferta Girls, Ferta Community, Ferta Fundraisers. It's good stuff. You know we like a lot of those products in there too. It's, it's part of their fundraising. Yeah, that my, mango habanero salsa. That's great stuff. I like the garlic. You like the garlic? I like the garlic. I need a little heat to my salsa. Yeah. I agree. Well, I do a salsa agree, guy. I agree. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We might find a little salsa later tonight. That, uh, where are we going later, guys? Half? Half brothers. Half brothers. I need to get, I'm, I've been so excited about getting Vigo some local brews here. So, uh, <laughs> I was warned no, no beer in the suite here at, at the Ralph. So we we'll to take care of GPL not podcast. Until, not until game day. Yeah. yeah, game day. Well, apparently last weekend it was flowing pretty freely, but <laughs> I'm looking forward to something afterwards. Yeah. Uh, we'll have a GPL uh, podcast beer of the week done. Definitely. I want to kind of talk about the history of these two teams, guys. Um, obviously, new leagues, they don't play as much anymore. It might not be as heated. I think the 
the players aren't as heated anymore. It's maybe more the fans. Yeah. Because the players, they don't play as much. Uh, what do you think, Biggs? It's, well, I, I think, think the fans get more excited. I, the players do too, but it's not 15 years ago. Well, it's modern hockey too. A lot of these players grow up playing together. We were talking about guys on this year's team. Yeah. You know, who knows each other? And it's like, oh, Snuggerud and uh, uh, Jackson Blake. Jackson Blake are mm-hmm. buddies all the way back. Yeah. Like they grew up playing summer hockey together, AAA teams together in tournaments together. That's just kind of modern hockey. There isn't, you know, I grew up in Eden Prairie and I grew up in Edina and we hate each other. <laughs> Those kids kind of play with each other growing up all the way. So now it's, it's a little different. And when they get to college, it's the same way. Uh, and I think the fact that you're not playing each other four times a year probably contributes a little bit to that as well, because yeah. the more you play someone, you know, the harder the grudges get. <laughs> you're not competing for the same trophy. You're not going for the McNaughton Cup every year. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that was a big deal. I do think they feed off the energy of the crowd, though. Like, yeah. even if if you were had no idea of the North Dakota Minnesota rivalry, and you dropped into those games last year, you would understand it yeah. very quickly that things are different that weekend. And I, uh, I think the players feed off off that a little bit. But I, I do think it's a little different than it was 15 yeah. years ago. And I found so, that even when St. Cloud came last year, the home and home, I, w- I was talking about, I think it was, I can't remember who I was speaking with, one of their, it might, might have been their SID. It's like, this is fun, but it's just not quite the same <laughs> because there's no points on it. <clears throat> yeah. It's, and it's, in the, it's October. No, 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 no yeah, team really knows each too. other yet, I right? I came up here and I was warm outside. <laughs> I wasn't freezing. <laughs> I do remember they played a series up here as conference uh, opponents really early in the year, and it kind of had that feel. You know, it was like did, neither team really knows what they are yet. You know, when, no. when they had those January battles, you know, they're fighting for positioning. You kind of knew that, you know, what each team was by that point. And um, right now you've got two teams that – have very different decors that are trying to uh, mm-hmm. find their way there, trying to see where guys are going to slot in in lineups. And, um, w- you know, who knows where both of them are going to be at the end of the year, no matter what the result is this weekend. Well, I think one key thing with these programs is every year they're trying to fill some holes, and it's usually yeah. with talented freshmen. Yeah. And yeah. they are just getting acclimated to college hockey. And I think one of the things that make Bob's Bob Mosco is such a good coach as he puts them in big roles right away. We're seeing Oliver Moore play lots of minutes up front. We're seeing Sam Renzil play lots of minutes on the blue line. They're both getting special teams time. You know, that's not common across many sports where coaches kind of let their freshmen cook like that. I think North Dakota is in the same boat. They've got 14 new players, yeah. a lot of them grad portal guys, but it's the same kind of situation. It's a little different playing for their previous schools than it is this yeah, out here for sure and then they've got freshmen playing huge roles too um you know but both teams have the type of freshmen that are able to handle that you know i, I think saturday night game last season you probably could make a really good argument the two best players on the ice were jimmy snuggerud and jackson blake and they were both freshmen you know mm-hmm. they were both fantastic in that game um and you know you mentioned Oliver Moore. Fans are going to see him. Minnesota fans are going to see Jaden Perron for the first time. Um, special players that are going to make an impact. And just because you're a freshman doesn't mean you can't do it in this game because they did it last year. And, and kind of going off that, Viggs, the freshman in a big game like this will also make mistakes, <laughs> which could really turn the tide <laughs> on any of these games real quickly. You know, We've seen it a lot of times. And that's kind of one thing I think we've always loved about college hockey is that there's a lot more mistakes <laughs> in college hockey. And when pressure like this, 14,000 people or whatever in the arena tomorrow night, both teams are going to be nervous. So both freshmen are going to be nervous. Don't make a mistake or don't make a mistake. So it, it's kind of a double-edged sword there. The, the freshmen can kind of sink or swim there. Well, and you want your players to learn what they can pull off and what they can't. Yeah, And it's October, so this is the time to do that. This is the time to see how much rope you can handle and what kind of plays you can pull off out there. And I think that's part of what makes college hockey great, and especially this rivalry, is the players so badly want to make a mark on this game. Hmm. And we were talking about the history. Ryan Lindgren, when he was a freshman, wanted to make his mark and make his presence known, and he grabs the North Dakota captain and gets into a scuffle 
on like his first or second shift of the game <laughs> to set the tone. Mm -hmm. And the players want to do that. Yeah, I mean, like you said, the the mistakes. I mean, last year it was uh, Logan Cooley, freshman, getting a five minute major in that game, and that was uh, uh, that played a role. You know, you don't have one of your most dynamic players in the lineup uh, trying to rally. Um, Pitlick throwing his stick. Pitlick, that changed the whole game. <laughs> yeah. Emotions get the. I'll never forget it. it. It was a great moment. It was fun, but it affected the game a lot. It was funny. I was just thinking, you know, PJ Fleck this year, one of his things is there's no momentum in football. It doesn't exist. <laughs> he tries to downplay it. I think he's trying to tell his players, be mature enough to <laughs> yeah. not let momentum impact you. I but momentum, the Western game, there's a little momentum at the end there. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. maybe. Momentum has a huge factor in games, especially hockey. When you mm -hmm. throw your stick into the crowd and, you know, you get that penalty or you have to sit out or whatever, it impacts the game. It fires up the other team. Though I think a North Dakota player saw that moment and said, I might want to do that later in the season. Yeah, <laughs> Jackson Blake did. <laughs> did um, he really? Yeah, uh, after an overtime yeah. goal, he did. Oh, uh, uh, that's different, though. He, he, goal, he, he, picked it. he picked it. He picked the time a little bit better. Um, that did not save him from getting grilled by his teammates after that, <laughs> afterwards. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, I thought more than anything, it, it – it killed Minnesota's momentum. They scored the goal. Everyone was into it. And then it was like, oh, but now he's in the penalty box for 10, 10 minutes. minutes. He got a 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Like There's no minor penalty. No. And then minutes. he did get benched. He got benched, benched for a little while. Yeah. yeah. And then there, there were penalties that followed that, though. Um, in North Dakota had a couple power play goals, I believe, during that 10 minute mm -hmm. span. Yeah. And that's what, you know, got him going. But yeah, I, thought that but was mistakes a, yeah again but it's a, and it's an emotional yes. year it's a big game you're excited mm -hmm. and you just it can be tough to control those emotions this, these weekends are so great yeah because of that yeah the emotion the, the, the electric atmosphere is big um just driving up that's what i was thinking about the whole entire time well i was listening to a bunch of podcasts i was listening to brad on the podcast i was listening to national guys talking about and every one of them they're talking about this series so the eyes of college hockey are definitely on a one versus five matchup, and then hopefully it pays off. Before we actually get into the weekend, Vegas, I noticed I mean, we've had a couple of people agree to come to the University of Minnesota. One of them was kind of a flip in, uh, in uh, LJ Mooney, and we have Hayden Reed. And then as you're driving up, what was it, Jacob Rombach? So we yes. got three commits this week. What do you know about them? Well, it's kind of funny. During the media day when Cole Iserman decommitted from Minnesota, I was going out east to stay home. I kind of asked Bob, you know, a lot of fans are nervous about the state of Gopher recruiting. And he's like, I'm not nervous. <laughs> Minnesota hockey's in good hands. And I think if I would have known these players were committing to Minnesota, I would have felt a little more comfortable about the state of recruiting. But LJ Mooney is probably going to be a first round type talent. He's a little guy. He's, you know, 5'7", 160 like, pounds. Yeah, if, if that. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, he's got some of that Cole Caulfield in him. And, just and, explosive. And he's a relative, isn't he a cousin or something? Of cousin Cooley? of Cooley. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody who thought maybe there were some issues with Cooley and the Gopher program, uh, the cousins committing to Minnesota, it's probably okay. <laughs> he probably feels good about the experience. Uh, but he's a high-end talent. Yeah. Reed is, is not as much of a big talent. He's more of a hardworking late bloomer guy. He was committed to Colgate, uh, decommitted with the coaching change that was happening there. I think the Colgate yep. coach uh, retired, yep. and so he opened it up. But he's kind of made his own way the last couple of years, uh, getting into the USHL this year and adjusting there. And this uh, kid from Spring Lake Park, uh, late bloomer. Uh, he's 6'5", multi-sport athlete, really impressed at the NDTP evaluations this summer, You know, decided – he didn't – well, I don't know if he got offered there or not, but he's probably going on the right path with, I think, Lincoln right now in yeah. the USHL, so he's kind of feeling that out. But he's a late bloomer. So all of a sudden you look at Minnesota's recruiting, they've got between uh, Romach, uh, Grimes, and Phillip, or Maceo Phillips, they've got three big-time defensemen committed. Mm -hmm. And then you look at LJ Mooney up front, things are looking pretty good for Gopher recruiting. And I, I know Jess Myers did tweet today, you can't teach – Six foot five. Yeah, can't. their D are big with uh, <laughs> Rombach and and Phillips. And uh, yeah. D isn't actually 
that small this year. Number five's a big kid. Yeah, Renzel's a big kid. Yeah. You know, it's going to be interesting to see how he handles this series. Yeah. I think against St. Thomas. Because he likes to push it up the ice a lot. Yeah. He can't do that here. Yeah, so I'm really interested to see what happens when he crosses the red line this series. If he plays a little more conservative and lets the game come to him. I was talking to Luke Middlestad about, you know, Saturday being coach's day. He said, well, it's been coach's week. <laughs> so I think the coaching staff has really been in the ears of the defenseman, especially about being on the right side of the puck in all situations and, and making smart decisions. Because I think this team proved on Saturday, when you've got Jimmy Snuggerud out there, Offense can come pretty easily when those chances are there. Yes. There's no need to chase. All right, we just need to hear from another one of our sponsors here, our, one of our favorites, Chill Boys. Hi, I'm Kevin. I've been part of the ball crew at numerous tennis events for years. They say I'm an excellent ball handler. It's my job to get loose balls where they're supposed to be, to make the players comfortable so they can focus on the task at hand, winning. Which is why I recommend Chill Boys life-changing bamboo boxers and boxer briefs. Chill Boys, comfort where it counts. Gotta say, I'm wearing my Chill Boys right now, Biggs. <laughs> <laughs> I love my Chill Boys. And of course, you know, a little, little incentive. They get a little percentage off if they use a certain code. Yeah, if you use pull tab 15 at checkout, you'll get 15% off your order at chillboys.com. And one thing we are also waiting for, Beegs, unreal. They, uh, we're getting some gear. It's coming. It's coming. I can't wait. I, I went simple. I just want a t-shirt and a hat. So hopefully it's coming too. But unreal has been on board and, uh, I can't wait to get some more gear. Yeah. We're all about Minnesota companies on the yes. Don't Fuck Live podcast. And, uh, Michael E. Jordan had $300 in his bank account and he's growing up. Brand looking to leave a legacy here. Unreal, independent local clothing company crafted around the athlete. They release fresh looks, the hottest drops, and donate 10% of all profits to organizations and worthy causes in our community. Visit unreal.co. That's a code, not com. And use the promo code PULTAP15 for 50% off your order there, too. It's always good. Always good. Okay, I saw a question here for Brad. I'll read it to you. Ryan K is asking, does Brad have any deep insights with things going on across college hockey? Rules that may be under consideration, tournament regionals, anything kind of going on behind the scenes? Uh, I know Eric Martinson's kind of part of some higher committees now. He is. He's uh, he's the chair of the rules committee, and this is a rules change year. So um, what you'll see him doing this weekend is he'll probably have a notebook with him. And when he sees something happen in a game, it gets his mind thinking and he'll jot it down. Like, this is something to discuss. Oh, this is something to discuss. He's, uh, he loves the role. Um, he uh, is quite passionate about uh, making college hockey better and more entertaining for the fans and, and things of that nature. And so uh, as the years go on, uh, he'll have some ideas. He'll get feedback from coaches who will say, hey, look, this isn't working. Yeah. Or this is something that we'll do. So I don't know if there's anything right now that I know for certain is going to come up, but I bet if you ask me in uh, February, we'll have some things that I'll, you know, we'll say, okay, this is becoming a trend and this can't happen anymore. So uh, definitely something to watch. And um, uh, if uh, I'm sure fans will have some suggestions for everyone on the committee, because uh, <laughs> Uh, people have uh, ideas of how to make the game better, which is great. And and Eric's one of them. So uh, I'm curious to see uh, what happens there. And actually a big thanks to Eric uh, Martinson. Um, I met him probably 10 or 15 years ago at the WCHA Final Five. Um, the Minnesota staff's crew used to do all the Final Five, but they'd also bring in somebody because they needed help. There was some fly blown out. They would, Eric Martinson would come in, help with stats. And then last year when they were down at Mariucci, I'm like, we'd love to come up there and do a podcast. Come on up. <laughs> so a big thanks to Eric for setting this all up so we could be here tonight. Um, and, of course, uh, Alec Johnson as well, helping us get in the building tonight. <laughs> they were a little hazy. They're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> kind of gophers doing in this building. But uh, um, big thanks to those two guys for allowing us to come in here. But, guys, uh, what about this weekend, Biggs? Piece. What do you want to see? Well, one thing I'm excited to see is Oliver Moore at wing. 
I know if people have been following the Gopher Puck Live podcast for a long time, sometimes I really like these speedy guys mm. to be put on the wing so they can get up and down the rink and not worry oh. so much about defensive responsibilities. Mm. Sammy Walker or something like that? Yeah, he just got called up to the walk. <laughs> and do you know what position he's playing? Not center. Not center. He's playing wing. So he's, <laughs> he's proven to be a pretty effective player. I've had a couple sit-downs with Bob over the last year or two. We are – Still agree to disagree on on some of that decision <laughs> making, but seeing him at wing will be really interesting to see. They'll put Brody Lamb to center. You know they tried him there a little bit during the preseason skates after a series against St. Thomas, where that body positioning and defensive priority has to come mm -hmm. in. Maybe they say Lamb might be better for the next little stretch here. We'll move more to wing. So it'll be interesting to see how he does there because he, he obviously is fast. <laughs> preseason media, Mr. Lamb. He, Moscow was big on him uh, and Kurtz as well. Um, three goals already on the season. He had four all of last season. Well, he's playing on the right line. Score that, that is true. <laughs> you but, know, when you're out there with Suggard and uh, more, it's going to come a little easier. You still got to put the puck away. And it's nice to see, uh, you know, that's, that's what Moscow's been talking about so long. You got to see players advance. You got to see them take another step the next year, and we're seeing that out of him. And even Pina Nimi. I mean, he hasn't scored yet, but he's hitting bodies. They're out there causing trouble. We'll see. Pino's got a little bit more to show. I okay, think, I think okay. Bob is trying to hope that Pino Nimi Talk steps, a little positivity on yeah. him. Yeah. I hope he okay. steps into that role, pumps up his tires a little bit, and, and plays more consistent. Because last year, you know, one of the things holding him back was that fourth line. You know, Bob would often shorten the bench to three lines. And not play the fourth as much. Mm -hmm. you know, he's got to find some balance. And with all the injuries early, you know, kind of impacts what they can do. You know, I think this weekend we're going to see Rhett Pitlick with Jackson Nelson and Bryce Brodzinski. That could be a fun line to watch this weekend. I thought Pitlick had an outstanding series against St. Thomas. His speed was really good. Mm -hmm. I also think he must be a little bit stronger because there were a couple times where he made body contact as he was trying to separate, and he was actually able to skate through the player. Last year. He'd be spinning around when that <laughs> happened. So maybe just a little bit sturdier this week. Uh, it should help him against a team like North Dakota, which is going to be physical. Brett, I would recommend that Brett Pitlick not throw his stick. <laughs> I would uh, guess that it'll come back like it did last year on the ice. <laughs> a North Dakota fan threw it right back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what do you what do you think of this weekend? What would you like to see? Well, I, I'm curious uh, how North Dakota uh, sets up this weekend. Um, do do they try to match lines? Do mm -hmm. you know they? Uh, do you go with uh, top lines uh, against each other? Do you throw in? They they have a third line. Um, I think they're starting to call them the Jays because they all have last names that start with J: Johannes, Jamernick, and James. Um, they're pretty. Good defensive line. Like Hunter Johannes skates a little bit better than I thought he would. Dylan James is a really good skater. They can place a physical, a little bit of physical game. Do they put those guys on the the snuggery line? Um, do they just try to match D? Uh, that's something sometimes coaches do. They don't really worry about the forwards, but they want certain D out there. When you know, um, I'll be curious to see how that matchup uh, plays out this weekend. Yeah, I think that. D matchup is going to be interesting because I don't know what Minnesota is going to do for their defensive combinations this weekend. Missing Chesley probably. If he's back, I'll be a little surprised. Mm -hmm. Never know. It could happen. But, you know, between Blake and Perron, those are two very dangerous players that you want to have defensemen who can see the ice and know who to pick up and, and match up. That kind of worries me for the Gophers this weekend, because I think they might be a little shorthanded taking care of those two. I, I'm concerned about Renzel. He's been pushing a lot. You get caught here, it's a two-on-one the other way real quick. Well, I think there's definitely going to be times when the Gophers are going to be in their own zone. We haven't seen that a lot the last two years. Okay. You know, they haven't had to defend for long periods of time. I think they're going to have to weather the storm out here because North Dakota's got pretty good forwards right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, with Blake and Perone, they've got two lines that can really dish and, and cycle and possess the puck. And I've always liked Hunter Johannes as a player. 
he's big and physical. He had a nice uh, weekend against the Gophers when he played for Lindenwood. Mm -hmm. You know, he grew up a fan of this rivalry. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this weekend means a ton for him, especially since he's wearing green. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's been a, a good pickup so far. He's uh, scored three goals uh, last weekend. Um, and, and he's been good in big games. When he was at Lindenwood last year, he scored in Mariucci against Minnesota, in the Ralph against UND, in Yost against Michigan, and at Magnus against Denver. Wow. So I mean, he's, that's, he's that's college hockey's four big rinks yeah. up there. <laughs> yeah. So he's 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 come up big, and you know he had uh, he scored against uh, Wisconsin and, and against Army uh, last week, and so he's been a good pickup um, for North Dakota. I think he's got a score at uh, BC to. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they BU, play BU, BU this year, yeah, so that's, his, uh, to that's his chance. To, yeah. That's quite the resume when you put there. it all yeah. together there. Yeah, and that's only like one year of work because he was at American International for three years before that, and he hardly he didn't play that much there. So didn't your whole D turn over this year? Yeah, not, not zero or back. So that's that's uh, that's because you know, we've talked about that. You know, how long can you sustain using the portal? Hmm. Well, we've talked about that a lot. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes, it could solve you for a year, but what's in the pipeline? I mean, uh, are you concerned about that, or is that some issues that the coaching is concerned about? Well, I know. I mean, I can see what's coming now for the next few years. Um, they they went and got some fifth year seniors this year, and I think that was intentional because they're clearing space for you know EJ Emery's coming next okay. year. Uh, he's a potential first round pick. Um, uh, they've got, uh, Andrew Strathman. He was a kid who he could have come this year, but I think they looked at him and said, there's some defensive things to iron out. Don't want to bring you in and struggle and be out of the lineup. Go back one more year. We'll, play more we'll, too. Play, yeah. And you know, he was, he played a decent amount for Youngstown. They, they play more here. Yes. Uh, he, he was very good on Youngstown last year, but there's still things to iron out. So they said, you know what, you go back, we'll find a fifth year to, you know, to help, help you develop a little bit more. So he'll be coming in. Jaden Jubinville's another guy. So the, they're next year. Do they get one defenseman out of the portal? Maybe mm -hmm. because otherwise you have a lot of freshmen and sophomore, you might want one older guy to mix in, but, um, they're going to be a lot lighter. I think it was a situation where uh, they lost eight guys and it was, okay, well, you either bring in eight freshmen, which is not going to be a good idea, or you can go grab Garrett Pike from Alaska, Keaton Pearson from Michigan. Um, you know, So uh, how many were are now fifth-year players? They have three fifth years. So, they'll so lose, that's not too bad. They'll lose three defensemen this year. They have three who are coming in next year. Um, you know, do, you know, you always have to wonder: does does anyone go in the portal? You know, that's you just don't know in this day. They they lost some guys last year who went in the portal that maybe they wouldn't have pegged. You know, Brent Johnson maybe he's a third round draft pick that just wasn't playing. Yeah, you know, you could probably guess that one. Uh, Luke Bast who went to Duluth, um, I wouldn't have guessed that one. That wasn't on my radar. So sometimes you just don't know um, when someone's going to leave and when you have to replace them, but. Um, yeah, they've uh, all eight or new four transfers, four freshmen. And the transfers are three fifth year seniors and then a redshirt sophomore, Bennett Zmolik, who did not play at all last year for Mankato because of a hip injury. So he's still coming back in right now. Did I see him on the power play a little bit this last weekend at all, Zmolik? Uh, uh, if, if you did, it was at the end at of the a end. power play. Okay. Um, but no, he's uh, there. They're, uh, Garrett Pike from Alaska is running their first unit. And Jake Livanovich, the freshman, is running their second unit. So uh, they have some young guys uh, playing big roles. But Livanovich uh, spent three years at Chicago, won a Clark Cup, and you know. And that that is Doug Smolik's kid, isn't it? It is. That's what I thought. It is. Yeah. So he's got a big weekend. He's he's playing his uh, his uh, dad's team this weekend, and yeah. then next weekend he's playing his old team and his brother's oh, old uh, old team. So he's he's taking the tour right now. How's the power play been looking so far for North Dakota? Because I, I imagine in a Minnesota North Dakota series, we're going to see some penalties, some power yeah, play but, opportunities. But, it, but I don't think it's early. So a lot of things haven't come together yet. It, it hasn't quite come together. Last year, it's it 
right away. Like okay. they were firing on all cylinders. And that's what happened in Mariucci. The Gophers took penalties yep. and they were just reeling off power play goals because that they were that power play. I mean, they were number one in the country for stretches of time. It hasn't quite got going yet. They scored uh, maybe two against Army uh, with uh, some mm-hmm. opportunities. It's not quite there yet. So we'll see. They have some pieces back. Gaber, Blake, both on that first unit. They've got Perron on the second unit right now. Um, so we'll see. But it, it's not quite like last year when they went into Mariucci. The week before, they played Quinnipiac here. They were down by three goals in the third. Quinnipiac took a couple penalties, and all of a sudden, goal, 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 goal. It was kind of like Saturday night at Mariucci, where if you took a penalty, they were it was trouble. Because last year, it seemed like as soon as Jackson Blake got the puck on a stick, Goals were coming yeah. on the power play. Mm-hmm. It's just like when the puck gets to Jimmy Sutherland's <laughs> stick for Minnesota. It seems right now goals are mm-hmm. coming. So those are those are two things to watch for, yeah. I think. Yeah. North Dakota definitely will not want Snugger to shoot the puck. That's going to be a huge emphasis, I would imagine, on on the penalty kill, uh, trying to uh, get the puck for, uh, away from him shooting. Blake is a kind of a – he's a much of a pass threat as a shooter. He doesn't shoot quite like Snugger. He's got a good shot. But he's really a playmaker. He's got too. the good vision. He does. So when the puck gets to him, all of a sudden he draws players and knows where to That's... go with it, or he gets it and guys are trying to take away lanes and he looks off and shoots. Exactly. And it's, That's it's what dangerous do. when you can do those two things. Correct. I think one thing Sudrud is doing is he's starting to play with his depth. Does he play close to the blue line or does he play close to the bottom of the circle? And, and he starts drifting around mm-hmm. and sometimes he'll make contact with the penalty killer. The penalty killer thinks he's right there, and then all of a sudden he's not. Backs off a little bit. Yeah, mm-hmm. give him, make some space. Yeah, so he's starting yeah. to get some savviness about how to get away from guys who are trying to take away that shot mm-hmm. all the time. Before we get into predictions, Brad, I wanted to get your kind of thoughts on the state of St. Cloud hockey. The school enrollment going way down. Um, we've talked about this a little bit. But I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts. It seems like it's not looking so bright in St. Cloud just for having sports. It's got to be about budgetary things yeah. have to be a concern. Um, I, I think there are a lot of schools facing enrollment issues right now yeah. across the country, and they're certainly one of them. Um, that is, uh, I think, something probably to watch in, in the future, just what... Five, you know, ten years, it could be no St. Cloud program. I mean, I, I, I just, I, I don't, I haven't gone that far to <laughs> look into that. I mean, it, it, it is, uh, I, I know that they're, um, they'll do whatever it takes to keep that, that program going. Um, but there's no question that they're facing budgetary challenges from an institutional level. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the bottom line, Beaks. I mean, you don't have kids coming to the school. A lot less money coming into this. Yeah, school. let's just fees. academically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think academically it could be a challenge, but I think the hockey program there is such a part of that school <laughs> that as long as that school's there, they will do what it takes. I hope so because it would really hurt this area. Yeah. I think. But yeah. um, uh, there's obviously things that could be out of their control. I mean, it's, Th- there it's are some serious. things that are right. Like if if the at some point budget cuts may come, you know, like. Uh, you know, North Dakota State has dealt with some of that with declining enrollment. Um, but, you know, I guess uh, they, they do have a, a really good uh, head coach that can probably navigate some of those budgetary challenges better than uh, others. And um, he's had a long history of success, but that, that definitely has to be a something to follow. And it's probably not only St. Cloud, like, in uh, you know, on campus enrollment is an issue that's yeah. facing a lot of colleges nationwide. They're all, you know, trying to figure out how to keep kids on on campus and stuff, especially post pandemic. I talked to a a friend of mine who, who's a professor somewhere out to, on the west coast uh, today, and. And she was telling me that the students have almost become clients. You're recruiting them and, wow. and looking at them as, as more clients than anything right now. And so uh, that's from someone who's at a school not even close to around here that doesn't have, doesn't have hockey. So this is uh, 
there's a lot of the schools. Definitely like, something to keep an eye on the next couple of years, I think. Yeah, I was talking to some people from the University of Minnesota last weekend, and they were just so impressed with how the students are showing up for mm-hmm. games at 3M at Mariucci and how much the St. Thomas fans showed up at Excel for that mm-hmm. game the night before. And he said one thing he's noticed with this generation of student is they crave shared experiences. So I think for schools, being able to create things like this, things like Mary G, you know, whatever you can do to create a shared experience, it, it makes going to college memorable and something they want to yes. be a part of. So, you know, I don't know what St. Cloud's going to do, but I know those hockey games are are fun to be at. Yeah. You, yeah. Know, you might have a hairy buffalo before you go. but <laughs> yeah. That's where you want to be. So trying to find more ways to create shared experiences. All right, guys, let's get into some predictions. I have a feeling we're going to say a lot of splits here, but be bold. Split. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think that's what I said the last few times, and I was right. Like, as much as I would like to throw something outlandish out there, it just seems like the logical uh, outcome. You get us, we we get you. We have a really small sample size of these teams, I feel, right now, especially with the new personnel. So if there is a sweep, will it surprise me? No. Because I I just have have seen North Dakota play one weekend, and I barely caught any of the Minnesota games. So I just – there's a lot of new pieces in there. Nothing really surprises me in in sports these days. But I'm going – I'm trying to be this – Smart and steady and go split. <laughs> okay. So I think it's going to be a split. But I think a more interesting question right now would be, who is more likely to sweep? Because I think going into this weekend, if I had to put the odds about which team I think has a better chance of getting two wins, I give it to North Dakota at this point. Okay. You know, Minnesota's battling injuries on their blue line. I think we saw them under pressure a lot against St. Thomas, and they, they figured it out by second. <laughs> They got bailed out with some good goaltending and some timely goals from Jimmy Stuggerud. But I think if they don't get those things, they might be in trouble. And I think North Dakota is the team that's more likely to sweep, even though I think they'll get a split. Also, can we point out that St. Thomas looks pretty good too? Like, I think some people saw the score and they're like, what happened? I'm like, well, I watched the weekend before when they played St. Cloud. They, they were They were good. Yeah, like it was a the, split, and then they, it was the second and, game they lost by a goal. Yeah, and and they uh, outshot them in the second game. Like I wa- I watched the Sunday game, and I was like, this St. Thomas team is pretty is is good. So, uh, um, I I think it's fair to put out there that in in you know, Augustana goes and sweeps Bull and Green last weekend. Teams can get good fast with the portal. So let's yeah. uh, you're uh, right. Put out there that these teams look good. Our guy Mote. Negative one for you, Viggs. I know. <laughs> I, I think one of the things that's interesting about that is Rico waited a little bit on who to take in the portal. He didn't just grab anybody right away. He picked some guys. And I thought the Tommies were hard to play against. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, Chesley might be dinged up is because he was he was challenged physically all weekend. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that he was looking for in the portal. He was looking not just for skilled guys. He was looking guys who could play heavy and difficult split i'm a, i'll say split as well because that's just how it is not very bold sorry fans there, there's been a lot of i'm not going to say go for sweep and a lot of upsets in college hockey yeah. i think this october time of year all the turnover the whole top 10 didn't do good last week yeah well, when, when i was still... doing my preseason rankings this year uh the thing that jumped out to me was like last year i did it and I looked at like Quinnipiac and Minnesota. That's who I had top two. I had Quinnipiac one, Minnesota two. And I was like, there, there's just not many questions. Like they both have their goalies back. They both have veteran D. They both have high end forwards. They both have impact freshmen. Like I have no questions. I know what they are. This year, every single team I went through, I had a question about. Some of them will figure it out, but there wasn't one team in the country where I said, I don't have a single question. You know, Denver's young on D and has a new Crone is gone. They have a new goalie. Minnesota had the D turnover. Quinnipiac lost their goalie and a couple high end D there. Uh, North Dakota has all their D turning over. BU and BC are talented, but they're so young. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michigan lost uh, their best forward D and goalie. Um, talent, but 
you know, what, we don't know what they have in net. Like, what team? There's not a team that. So that's why I'm not surprised we're yeah. seeing results all over the place. I think we're going to see that honestly it's, all it year. It just makes it more fun, Biggs. It does. It just makes it way more fun. The best part about college hockey oh. is that. But, but not for fans who are used to seeing their team win 80 percent of their games. Those fans are not going to have a fun oh, year. Oh yeah. Bring back the WCHA, blah, blah, blah. We've been hearing that too long. Well, I think part of the transfer portal era means that teams have a hard time holding on to their depth. Mm -hmm. I heard, you know, Bob talking about that a little bit this week, you know, how he hasn't gotten the portal, but someday he might. I heard Derek Schooley talking about it the other day where he's like, you know, with NIL and, and ice time, you know, players are going to leave. So depth is an issue. And, you know, and conversely, teams that have holes can fill them with veteran guys. Like, let's say it, 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 10 years ago, you lose eight defensemen, you're going to be in for a challenging year. No. Now you can go get three 23-year-old guys who are been around, and all of a sudden you're right back. Mm -hmm. So, like, it works two ways. Like, some teams can fill holes. Some te I don't know. I just – it's. Uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting year. It would have been really interesting if Logan Cooley had made his decision right after the Frozen Four that he was going to turn pro. Would Bob have gone in the portal yes. and grabbed somebody? Yes, I think. Probably. You know, because it happened so late, he brought in Nick uh, Michael from St. John's, mm -hmm. so he's not upsetting the apple cart. Or was that Jimmy Clark? Well, I think Jimmy Clark was the first one to come in, and that's, you know. Yeah. Because we knew they were going to be kind of short anyway. I think Bob likes a short bench if everybody can play. Yeah, but if, if they can injuries like they do have now on the defense, it's 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 problematic. Yeah. So well, thanks for coming out for us. Great to see you guys. Glad to be yeah. here. We're glad to be here. And hopefully we'll be back in three years, two years, whatever it is. Yeah, the next two years, yep. Yeah. One year off and then we'll be back. I'll be back there, like YouTube. They always like to be first. Uh, Pop up that PDF. Well, maybe not. Uh, we'll see. Right. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. You heard it here, right? From the Slash <laughs> Gonna be back at the Ralph here. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> possible. Subscribe yeah. to the Grand Forks Herald, yeah. and then you'll be first to know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's fun to have you on the show. Um, we'll be back, of course, next week when uh, our one of our favorite other guys, Mr. Molesky, is back in college hockey. Oh, love it. You know, he was out last year. We missed him on the podcast. And we then we did have him on for the Frozen Four. But he's back in hockey full time, and I swear it's like you two have so much information. Yeah, from I, all college hockey. I get it from Todd and pass it along to everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> he's the encyclopedia. So we'll uh, we'll definitely have Todd on, and it, it'll be fun as usual. Of course, we want to thank Brad for being on the show. We'll thank Eric Martinson and Alec Alec Johnson for allowing us to come here. Sorry for the initial mute. I'm not sure what happened there rookie era i guess but uh it was a fun show no overtime this week well we're gonna have overtime we're gonna leave you guys behind we're gonna have overtime so but other than that we'll catch you next week on the gpl podcast